On September the 8th, 2022, the Queen of the United Kingdom died. Did you know that at the same time, the Queen of New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Tuvalu, the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Grenada, Jamaica, and half a dozen other places also died. Now that Queen Elizabeth II is dead and her son, Charles III, is king, what is the future for the monarchy? And then looking back at her life, what is her legacy in all these places, not just the UK? Hi, I'm Toby Harper. I'm an assistant professor in history in the School of Historical, Philosophical and Religious Studies at ASU. I wrote a book about the British Honours System, which is an institution that's closely connected to the monarchy, especially in the minds of the people who receive British Honours. So I'm really interested in these connections between the monarchy and British society, but not just British society, also the monarchy and the Commonwealth and former empire. So what does it mean for a modern democratic country like the UK to have a king or queen? Britain has a constitutional monarchy. That is, the monarchy kind of sits on top of its kind of regular systems of democratic government. This has been the case for quite some time. Uh, the principle of parliamentary supremacy over the monarchy has been established in Britain since 1688. But, so what, what this means today is that the constitutional monarchy kind of sits on top of all these other structures of government. The queen or king is supposed to reign but not rule. They're supposed to not get involved in the regular systems of government. In practice, however, this is, this is actually a lot more complicated because there are other ways to exert power other than through, directly through government. The British monarchy is a symbolic head of the nation. It's the sovereign of the nation. And there are a lot of ways in which this plugs into other power structures. Another th really important thing to keep in mind about the British monarchy is that while it may look kind of old with its you know, carriages and its regalia and medals, it has also been pretty adaptive throughout the 20th century and throughout the last 70 years when, when Queen Elizabeth II was queen to social change. The monarchy has evolved with the times and is pretty self-conscious about evolving with the times. But just because you try to adapt to something doesn't mean you succeed. I think one of the real challenges over the last 70 years of Elizabeth II's reign has been adapting to the pace of change in British society and dealing with some of the legacies of royal symbolism and royal expectations. One of the most famous examples here is the way in which Elizabeth dealt with her son's marriage to Princess Diana, who died tragically in a car crash in 1997, hounded to death by, by the paparazzi. The British monarchy has this strange symbiotic relationship with the media that, that, helped, that, that really caused this. Elizabeth was largely responsible for her son marrying someone that he ultimately didn't love. And in hindsight, this was tremendously cruel, both to him and to, to Diana. So this, this left a, a lasting breach within the family. I think another challenge in Elizabeth's reign was her relationship to these other states where she was queen. That she, during her reign, the British Empire fell apart and a lot of these colony, a lot of colonies chose to drop the queen entirely and become republics, but a few held on, quite a few held on, and kept her as queen. But that's a complicated relationship. The, um, the British monarch is, is first of all the king and queen of the UK and pays a lot less attention to these other territories. Decolonization and problems managing the royal family were real issues for Elizabeth as queen and as a kind of matriarch to that family. Another part of her legacy though is that she was beloved by a lot of people in the UK and outside the UK. And there are reasons for this. This was not simply a reflection of her, of her high position and status. So for instance, in my own research, I've found that people who write memoirs of, in which they describe meeting the Queen at royal garden parties or when they were receiving honours had you know, only a few moments with her, but always remembered in a great deal of detail that encounter. And this was because she was really good at connecting with people really quickly. 
people of all different kinds, people from different backgrounds, different classes, different parts of the world, she knew how to immediately connect to them. People would say, on the one hand, she is special, she is unique, she is the queen. And on the other hand, she is one of us. This is a pretty difficult legacy for her son, the new King Charles III, to live up to as we look to the future of the monarchy. So to understand the future of the British monarchy, we have to look at the problems of the present. And there are a lot of things that the new king is facing that carry on issues that were already, ex already changing rapidly in British society and in these other places where the British monarch reigns. To start with those, Barbados became an independent state. It, uh, dropped the monarchy la just last year because Barbadian identity just didn't really line up, line up with the monarchy anymore, that it wasn't appropriate for a post-colonial state to hang on to this colonial monarch. A lot of other countries are looking at doing the same thing, and I think Prince Charles's ascension to the throne will be a, will be a catalyst for this. At home, there are problems too. I think one of the challenges for the monarchy is choosing which parts of society it reflects. Britain is a deeply divided set of four nations. They all have their problems and they all have major internal divisions. And I think the recent controversy about the departure of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle really illustrates this. This is both, these are both divides within nations, but also this is a generational divide. That how younger generations see the monarchy, both from within and from without, is different to how the older generations see the monarchy. And it, I can't help but connect the family troubles that Charles has had with the wider problems of, in British society that the royal family is trying to adapt to. So the reign of King Charles III is going to be a different monarchy, necessarily, from that which those of us who grew up with Elizabeth remember. It'll be a different monarchy, not just because Charles is famous for his you know, political meddling, but also because he's a different person and he's facing different, a different society, different challenges. They are related to those that his, his mother faced, but as we enter a, a new future, they're going to be quite different. I don't quite know what that future holds. I'm, not, I'm a historian, I'm not good at predicting the future, but I think we can be fairly sure that the monarchy is going to ha have to adapt in new ways or see its influence over 70 million people in, in the UK and more than 70 million more in the rest of the world slip away. So if you're interested in learning more about these complex relationships, these global relationships between ancient little monarchies and modern political systems, check out the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Arizona State University.